soru kısmına geçiyoruz ve söz sizin. Buyurun. Dear guests, our, now our 10 minute question and answer session started. You may now ask your our speakers your questions please. Evet, buyurun. The microphone is coming. Okay. Testing. Uh, my first question is to uh, Dr. Rana. Um, you touched a little bit about uh, on proteins. Could you explain a little bit more on um, why proteins cannot come into existence by chance? Bizim mikrofonumuz yok yalnız burada. Aldılar mikrofonumuzu. Now just a second, it's coming. Yeah. Teşekkür ederiz. I, well, I, to, I think to address your question, one of the, the big problems I think confronting origin of life research is how do you account for the origin of information? Um, and so um, proteins are information-rich molecules, DNA and RNA are information-rich molecules. <clears throat> now original life researchers actually argue that it's RNA that comes into existence first before uh, DNA and proteins. So to think about the chance of proteins coming into existence is probably not relevant to how original life researchers think. We're better off asking, what is the likelihood of RNA coming into existence by chance in the information you would need for what's called the RNA world hypothesis? And the experiments that original life researchers have done trying to generate information in RNA all require intelligent input in order to generate those kind of molecules. Uh, and so, um, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of the probability calculations because I think there's a lot of biochemistry that you really need to grasp to do those calculations appropriately. But I've yet to see anybody uh, truly produce the information that you need for even a single molecule through some kind of natural process evolutionary mechanism. Uh, the only time that I've seen people successful towards that end is when the design is built in the very experimental experiment itself. So they're smuggling in information and design in the way they're, they're doing those types of experiments. I, I don't know if that's addressed your question, but... Yeah, yeah um, uh, AJ suggested that maybe I offer a quick comment on why is it that the origin of life community is so committed to an RNA world. It's interesting to me because, as I mentioned, the problems are so legion with the RNA world that people like Orgel throw up their hands and say, it looks like it's a miracle. But you have to appeal to an RNA world because the problem is uh, when you have DNA and proteins, DNA can only replicate if proteins are present to replicate the DNA. But you can only get proteins if you have DNA. This is called the chicken and egg paradox. And the only way out of that, that paradox is to say, there was some other biochemistry first that then gave rise to that DNA protein world. That's why they, they're committed to the RNA world process. Mm -hmm. So in my view, we don't even have to argue about information because the, the chemical problems are so foundational that you can't even get an RNA chain, let alone one that has information. Thank you. Next question, please. Dr. Brown as well. Uh, what would you say about the production-like entities um, in the lab? I'm, I'm sorry, it's, uh, there's a little bit of an echo. I didn't yeah. quite hear. Um, what would you say about the production-like of cell-like entities in the lab? Oh, okay, the production of cell-like, yeah. You know, this is interesting because uh, a few years ago, if you would have said to anybody who is a knowledgeable biochemist that we were going to be able to create artificial cells in the lab, they would have laughed in your face. 
but it's the advances that have happened are so remarkable that we really are on the cusp of making cell-like entities in the lab. Uh, but this doesn't mean that um, a, you know, a creator isn't necessary. This doesn't support the evolutionary paradigm at all. In my mind, I can't wait till that happens because that's going to be a clear example of intelligent agency. Uh, we don't have to talk about a watchmaker argument or what evolution can or can't do. We can just go and empirically say, look what it took you to do this, this work. And these scientists that are doing this work are so proud of their accomplishments and so they want you to think that what they did was really significant and based on their superior intelligence, and it is. So you can basically play off of that, that pride to some degree and say, look what it took you to do this. This is clearly evidence for an intelligent agent. Uh, but the way I like to think about that, the work in terms of making cellular life is similar to... Um, you know, the construction of an automobile, as, as A.J. was mentioning, you know, um, an automobile operates according to the laws of chemistry and physics. We can assemble an automobile, but ultimately that the automobile requires a mind to undergird it. And that, I think this is really what synthetic biology is showing us. For me, I, I, I think there's not going to be a more powerful case for a creator we can make in the upcoming decades than the work that's happening in synthetic biology. Next question. Sunumunuz için teşekkür ediyorum öncelikle. Ben de sizinle aynı fikirdeyim. Anlattıklarınızla ilgili bir henüz bir saniye kulaklıkları tarzı. Kulaklıkları yok şey için. Evet. Tercüme için. Anlattıklarınızla ilgili e, bir sorum yok fakat CERN'de yapılan deneyde e, tanrı parçacığı buldular e, e, son okuduğum haberlere göre. Bununla ilgili ne diyorsunuz? Birkaç cümleyle <gülüyor> fikrinizi merak ediyorum. Yeah. That's above our pay grade. We're just biochemists. Uh, and, and this is a, a particle physics question. But good, good, lucky for you, there's a guy right here, Jeff Zwerink, who is a physicist who, who could answer that question. We, we could actually invite Jeff up now to answer the question. Is that yes, okay? Jeff, can you come up and or, or answer the question? Why not? For, Why we not? Can, we can do that if you Or we could wait. Or you I don't, can answer it right there or over there. Orada da cevap verebilir soruyu isterse. Tabii. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. You can... Um, the discovery of the God particle, I, I will say, first off, that's a term that no scientist uses for that particle. Uh, it's the Higgs boson. The reason why it's important is that it helps us explain why all the particles that we know of have the mass they do. And so it doesn't create mass, but it's it says that we understand the mechanism by which all the particles have the mass they do. And if they didn't have the masses that they have, then a, a universe where the complexity that life requires wouldn't be possible. And so it is, from a scientific perspective, the one of the last pieces of, or one of the last particles in our standard model that we thought was there, that discovering it says, yes, we're really on the right track. Um, and it's important because it helps us understand why everything has the mass that it does. And it really points out that we live in a universe that does seem to be designed for us. And as an interesting feature, the mass that it has says that our universe probably isn't going to stick around too much longer. Now, to an astronomer, not too much longer means another few billion years. So this isn't eminent, not, not like the universe is going to collapse or anything. But it does say that our universe is going to decay away and not exist in not too awfully long. And I think that's an interesting feature from a theistic perspective. Thank you. So Thank next you. question. Can I ask a question to Ms. A.J. Roberts? Please. Thanks Thank for you. the presentation. I want to ask about the DNA molecule. Uh, do you think DNA molecule can come, uh, come into existence without proteins or vice versa as evolutionists claim? Could you please explain? 
Um, no, I didn't, I didn't make this claim, and I apologize if, if I was unclear and, and perhaps conf confused the interpreter or spoke incorrectly myself. No, no, so, it was not your comment. Yeah. The evolutionists claim that the DNA molecule can come into existence without proteins. Is that possible? Um, I believe it is not. It's, it's possible in the laboratory to get uh, the synthesis of a few amino acids in a DNA strand, uh, but again, that requires intelligent manipulation of the chemical environment, and also if it's going to contain any information that would actually be able to be uh, transcribed and later translated into a protein or transcribed into a functional RNA, then that information must also be provided by the scientist who is trying to synthesize the strand of amino acids. So in nature, under naturalistic conditions of early Earth, it is highly unlikely that strands of, it, of DNA would come into existence. So if we think of the cell, can we say that DNA and the protein molecules have to be present at the same time? Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That is the chicken and egg problem on, on steroids because you not only need it to happen once, you need it to happen multiple times for the various subsystems and complexities of the intercellular organelles and, and mechanisms. That's the direct evidence of God's existence. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Next question. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for your presentation. I read some time ago, many years ago in fact, a very interesting book which was a dialogue between a theologist and a scientist. And uh, of course the discussion was how come you can have evidence that God exists. And at the end of the discussion, which was very interesting, was the fact that the scientist, who was a biologist, could not uh, uh, explain why every cell, and even the most simple one, uh, has a will to live. Mm -hmm. And then, from that uh, uh, conclusion, the theologist uh, remarked, well, that's God. That's why every living creature, the, simple, uh, the most simple one, and uh, the more so most sophisticated, has a will to live. And the only way to explain that is God. I would like you to comment on that. Thank you. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting um, a really interesting perspective because it's very true that when you look at cells, they seem to be constructed in such a way to ensure their survivability. And so, even if a mistake happens in DNA replication, the machinery that's in place to correct those mistakes uh, is so sophisticated. I used to work uh, for uh, a research and development company, and so we would produce, uh, pro and we would take R&D and translate it into products. So it was fun for me to go to see assembly lines where they were turning our ideas into actual products. And when you see the quality control systems that engineers produce to ensure proper production, they're very sophisticated. And inside the cell, there's all these quality control systems that are linked to the survivability of the cell that are so much more sophisticated than anything engineers could do. And that, to me, uh, suggests design. But to build off of that idea, which is, again, a very intriguing idea, when it comes to human beings, we not only have survivability, we also have a very strong sense of destiny. And in fact, our sense of destiny will drive us further and harder than our sense of survivability. And that, to me, is extremely provocative, that we are more concerned with our, with our destiny than, than our survivability. Though we, are, we do want to survive, of course, and those mechanisms are there. And that really suggests that we are created for a realm beyond where we're at now, for me, for me. So very, very interesting, very interesting thought. Thank you. Thank you.